Okay. All right. That's, that, that works. Okay. Well, uh, good, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm Sandy Sachuk. I'm the systems chair of the Mingxia Department of Electrical Engineering here at USC. And I want to welcome all of you to our annual Viterbi lecture. This uh, lecture is uh, our uh, way of honoring uh, leading people in information theory and communications. It's an annual event. This is now the fifth Viterbi lecture. And it draws on the very strong heritage of communications and information theory here at USC. In fact, on our USC faculty, we have four Shannon Award winners. And uh, the uh, original core of uh, many of our electrical engineering faculty were people who come from this particular field. So we have a long uh, history, long heritage in this area. Uh, before we start today, I'd like to introduce a few of our very special guests today. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, USC alumnus and trustee Andrew Viterbi and his wife Erna. And as you know, uh, Andrew Viterbi uh, uh, provided the naming gift for our school uh, back in uh, 2004. I also want to introduce another special guest, USC alumnus and uh, trustee Ming Xie. And, and uh, Ming Xie provided the naming gift for our department uh, in fall of 2006. Also, we have uh, our dean, uh, Janis Jortzos. <laughs> and the electrophysics chair of our Mingxia department, Dan Dapkus. <laughs> and so I'll go ahead and introduce our honoree. He is Professor Robert McLeese from the California Institute of Technology. And uh, his family is stuck in traffic somewhere, so when they show up, we'll introduce them too. But uh, we uh, are delighted to have him here today. Uh, Bob McLeese is the Alan J. Puckett Professor of Electrical Engineering at Caltech. And he also has a, a long relationship with Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. At Caltech, he was the Executive Officer for Electrical Engineering and he has won several awards at Caltech for teaching excellence. I think we're going to get a chance to see some of that in action tonight. He's also the author of three textbooks and more than 250 research papers, and he's won many awards, too numerous to list, but I just uh, two of the most recent ones, uh, the IEEE Third Millennium Medal in 2000 and the IEEE Information Theory Society Shannon Award uh, recently in 2004. He's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And he's not only done theoretical and applied work of uh, significance, but uh, great practical value in interplanetary communication systems. And in fact, uh, he was one of the designers, or the chief designer, of the Viterbi decoders for Galileo, Pathfinder, Cassini, and the Mars rover missions. So, Here's someone who has firsthand practical application knowledge of uh, the Viterbi algorithm. And so the title of his talk is Learning to Teach the Viterbi Algorithm. We're delighted and honored to have Bob McLeese here this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you for that kind introduction, somewhat exaggerated introduction, Sandy. Uh, it goes without saying that I'm honored to be here, but I'll say it anyway. It's a great honor for me to speak, especially at a, a lecture uh, named after Andy Viterbi, uh, who uh, he and I have known each other for uh, many decades, and I'm a great admirer of his, and it's, it really is a thrill for me to be here tonight. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, but I'd like to start with a proviso. I'm not on top of the technology. There. Um, this, this talk is not to be taken seriously. This talk is fun. If you're expecting to hear the latest uh, 
uh, tech breakthroughs in theory or practice about telecommunication systems, you need to go somewhere else. Uh, persons attempting to find anything practical in this talk will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find anything original in it will be banished. Persons attempting to f draw any conclusions from it will be shot. That's from Huckleberry Finn, you might remember. Um, so it's a lecture in communication, and I ask myself, what should I talk about? Uh, and I, and I, 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 I'm reminded of a t typical conversation in a cocktail party where someone asks, what do you do? And you say, engineering, well, that stops the conversation immediately. <laughs> You say mathematics, that also stops the, the conversation immediately. But if you say communication, you get a funny reaction. They say, oh, uh, TV or uh, broadcasting. There's several kinds of communications. You well know it at, at, at Southern California, at USC. But it seems to me, and my own research is in telecommunications or digital communications or theoretical communications or communications theory. But as a teacher or a professor, I'm also a communicator in the sense that my job is to communicate to the students, whatever it is I know. And so I thought it wouldn't be too, uh, out of line to, for me to talk tonight about uh, communication in, in that sense, about the communication. So I'm going to so I'm gonna tell you some, so over the years, it's been my job, sometimes I've been successful and sometimes not, to teach the basics of what is ultimately a very complicated and mathematical subject to beginners and try not to scare them off in the first lecture. And so I've, I've developed some techniques which are sometimes successful in doing that, and I'd like to share some of those with you. So, but, so, so this, is, this is really two talks in one. If you, already know, if, you're al if you already know this stuff, you're not going to learn anything new, but you might learn some tricks that you can use to teach your teachers, uh, to teach your students. But if, you, if, 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 if per chance there's someone in the audience who doesn't already know about Viterbi's algorithm, which is the, a, a, a cornerstone of uh, Andy's uh, profound reputation, you might learn something about that. So the subject is, about which I'm teaching, is, is communication. And the sub-subject is error control, or, con uh, or communicating in spite of errors. Now, again, to motivate students, you don't have to motivate people to talk about errors that already know about this. Oscar Wilde said that a poet can survive anything but a misprint. And uh, so a misprint is an example of, 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 uh, of a kind of error that we can't really control because it's, it, it's, it's, it's an error that occurs in a natural language, for me, English, for other people, other languages. But it, we, we, there are a lot of games. So, let me, so I don't want to get too far in this direction, but I want to, uh, I want to tell you about error correction. Uh, so so uh, Oscar was wrong. Uh, you can survive a misprint if, if you're careful enough. So for example, uh, here's a word in which one, it's a five letter word in which one of the letters has been changed to another letter and you should be able to decide what the word is. Somebody must know what it is. TR and uniquely TR. There's no other word with those that differs from that word in five letters. A computer search and dictionary does this. So here's, this, this is a correctable. I'll let you think about this. They, they, they don't look like words, but they're, they're correctable by themselves without knowing the context. Uh, exactly. So English has some ability to, to correct errors, and it, this, what does this have to do with my talk? It's really the other side. So, some some misprints are not correctable. So here's here's a bunch of words. In fact, there are 15 words, and and uh, to use the technical term, these are 15 words all with Hamming distance two or less from each other. So this is an example. If you if you write a po poem with one of these letter words in it and and, and make an error, uh, you, uh, you you can't correct it. Um, here's here's a, here's some text that I looked up. That's text without any errors. That's from Finnegan's Wake. I wonder, can he? Well, never mind. Here's an example of a Korean. I, I, told my, I taught a class in error correcting codes the last quarter, and I told them that I was coming to USC when this was the context. And I said that there must be things like this in other languages. And I have a lot of international students, one from Korea, for example, some from China, some from Japan, some from Arabic-speaking countries. And I said, what, are there any famous examples of, of, of words or symbols that are close to each other which mean different things that a misprint could be, uh, could be fatal? And this is a terrific example, given my Korean student, Chris Cheng, that the, the, these, two, these two pictographs, uh, which you have to look really close to see the difference, mean what the top one means stranger and this bottom one means sweetheart. And you can imagine there are, there are songs. 
there are there are songs about the uh, the, the confusion between uh, sweethearts and strangers. Okay, so now that was that's sort of the the, the introduction to the uh, to the to the talk. I want to talk about zeros and ones. That's the the the, the language the the the, uh, uh, the uh, alphabet that I'm most familiar with. And it, it, everyone should know that zeros and ones suffice to communicate anything. Anything can, that can be said can be said binarily. Or 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 is or is that correct? So I, now I want to show you my favorite episode from Star Trek. I'm a Trekkie, but the first generation, and this this episode, that 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 plot, hinges on the fact that you that zeros and ones are not enough to communicate anything. And I want you. So here's basically the plot is this: an old friend of Captain Kirk's named Captain Pike has been horribly uh, injured in a it, whilst uh, heroically saving some space cadets from from an exploding starship, and he lives in a tin can. And the tin can uh, uh, has a light that lets him say yes or no. Let's do that again. With a flashing light, you can say yes or no. Can you explain him now? Now the one. We've tried question. He's almost agitated himself into a coma. How long did it? As long as any of us. Blast mass in airway. We've learned to tie into every human organ in the body except one. The brain. The brain is what life is all about. Now that man can think any thought we can. Love, hope, dream as much as we can. And he can't reach out and no one can reach in. He's blinking. Oh. No, the why? <coughs> we'll come back to him. Before I get to that, I want to say so. What a what a stupid episode! The, 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 if if I were wanting to talk to Captain Pike, I, you don't have to think very long to come up with this. I'd say, Captain Pike, can you hear me? Blink. <laughs> I want you to think of a sentence which describes what's wrong with you. Have you thought of the sentence? Blink. Is the first letter A? Blink, blink. And anyway, in, in ten minutes, you could figure out that that what 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 the what what was going on. What what actually was going on is that Jeffrey Hunter, who had first uh, auditioned for the part of Captain Kirk, didn't want to, didn't want the part, and they had to write him out of it. And so they 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 had a they had to create an accident that caused uh, uh, the Captain Pike uh, to look like that. Anyway. The p point of this is that this is this is this is really a hilarious uh, uh, episode of Star Trek. But, but nevertheless, you can say anything you want with, with zeros and ones. But what if the zeros and ones have ev have errors? I I I can do no better than to quote Professor Golom, who wrote some years ago, "A message with content and clarity has gotten to be quite a rarity. To combat the terror of serious error, use bits of appropriate parody." <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. So now this is this is one of the teaching tools that I've used, developed over the years to explain how parity, which I'm going to explain to you, can be used to correct errors. And we'll get on to Viterbi's algorithm later. This is called the seven four Hamming code. Some of you have seen this before, but perhaps not all. So here's a little box which contain has four compartments, and each compartment is a, is allowed to contain a zero or a one. Uh, it, it doesn't matter whatever you like. I'll Let's do that. Some packet of zeros and ones. Uh, this you, you're in business, and you're in business to deliver packets of bit, uh, bits uh, fa uh, uh, accurately from the, from a transmitter to a receiver. So here are four bits that have to be transmitted from point A to point B, but the zero might change to a one, or might change to zero. There might be misprints, there might be errors, there might be dropouts, and you have to protect it against that. This simple technique does the trick. So here are the four customer bits. And the, the trick, the way to correct errors, is, is to add three um, engineering mathematics uh, or parity bits, which are related to the four information bits in a very specific way, which was invented by Richard Hamming in 1950. So, the, so again, the picture is these four bits you have no control over. They're, they're, they're given to you by the customer. These three bits uh, you can do whatever you want with. And the, the way to do this, a way to do this, is to use what this diagram, which is called a Venn diagram, 
you've probably seen it before. The thing to draw, I, the t thing to notice is that the Venn diagram divides the picture up into seven compartments. Three, uh, four white compartments, one, two, three, and four corresponding to the four information bits, and three dim compartments corresponding to the, uh, the, the parity bits of uh, uh, five, six, and seven. And so the first thing you do to do, to do the encoding process is you download the bits into the encoder, and then you compute bits five, six, and seven according to the rule that Hamming devised, which is this. This bit is either a zero or one, and it, it and if it's chosen so that the total number of ones in the circle under question is an even number, like zero, two, or four. So since the number of ones currently is one, which is an odd number, to make this an even number, this has to be a one. All right, that's called even parity is is is, is imposed on these these four bits of the block of seven. You, you see this one, you should be able to, if you're with me, you know that this bit is a very good class, and this bit is a zero. Okay, so that's that's the encoding process. You're supposed to look at this example, but think more general. The idea is you have some bits that are given to you by the customer, and you want to tie them up in a package with parity bits, which uh, which uh, put a pa pattern where there is no pattern, and you can re uh, recover from errors. So now you upload the encode word, the code word, back into the transmitted frame. and send it down the channel. That's a transmitted code word. Now we're going to make some errors. And th this particular scheme only corrects one error, but it, so somebody give me a number between one and seven. Three. That's just like we practiced. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so three is an error, and so th then this is from an omniscient viewpoint. We know that three is an error, but we're neither the sender nor the receiver. What the receiver gets is these seven bits they all look equally good or not good to to the to, to this to uh, to the receiver. Now, what is the rec the receiver corrects the error by doing an operation called decoding. And the decoder looks like the encoder, except it sort of runs backwards. So the first thing is you download the noisy code word into the decoder, and we don't have we we don't put the parity bits in because they're already given to us. And now I've I've colored these bits red because I want to think of this as a mystery story now. There are seven bits have been transmitted, and one, one is an error. And I want to identify the one that's an error, and so, I, so initially I suspect everybody, and that's why they're red. And I go through these three circles, and I see whether the parity is respected or not. And uh, in this case, it's not. So that means if there's only one error, we're going to use sort of an Occam's razor approach. If there's only one error, it's in that circle, which means the bits outside of the circle can be exonerated. In this error, uh, there, here also parity is violated. So the bits outside this compartment are also exonerated. And down here, this, this parity is also violated. So that guy's, and so by a process of, of triangulation, in, uh, in, uh, unfailingly, we identify the error that, in this case, it was location three. And the error is corrected, and we go on. Somebody asked me what happens if there are two errors. Good question. <laughs> Sometimes a class is better than another. What happens if there are two errors? I once told the students there's no such thing as a dumb question, only a dumb student. <laughs> they didn't know. They didn't, weren't expecting that. Okay. Okay. So let's somebody give me two numbers between one and seven. Four and. And seven. Okay, let's see what happens. Remember that, four and seven. I'm going to go through this quickly because we have other fish to fry. Let's download and see what happens. Okay, so these are everybody's a suspect. Everything is good in here. Parity is, is, is uh, satisfied, so those guys are innocent. Parity is violated, so that guy is innocent. Parity is uh, satisfied, so this guy is innocent. And uh, we, we find out that there's an error in compartment six. And what was that? It was four and seven. So what happens? First of all, the decoder can't be blamed for this. It's an Occam's razor decoder. It finds the simplest, the simplest explanation for this particular pattern of, of parity check violations is a single bit error in compartment six. The fact that there's a more complicated explanation, one and three and one and uh, four and seven, uh, is, is uh, 
the, the, the decoder can't be blamed for that. And so the conclusion is the Hamming code does not correct two errors. In fact, although the Hamming code is a practical scheme that can be used for protecting uh, certain kinds of uh, mass memories, it's not useful in, in this form for telecommunications. And so we want to talk, so the question is how do we correct, uh, how do we correct two errors? And that brings me to the heart of today's talk. With two errors, we use convolutional codes and Viterbi decoding. So let me give an example of that uh, and how I introduce students to this, th th this, this, uh, this concept. Now, yes, OK. Correcting more than one error, convolutional codes of Viterbi decoding. So, this is, so that as, as the, the Hamming code is based on a diagram, the Venn diagram, which is used for the encoder and the decoder. Convolutional coding is based on a diagram. In this case, it's a trellis diagram. This is only one example. I'm not going to tell you what a trellis diagram is, but it just looks like this, and there are many, many versions of it. But, but this is a fair representation. So the idea is that we're going to use the, 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 the geometry of the Venn diagram to protect a block, in this case, of four bits from two errors as it's transmitted down the channel. In order to do this, we have to uh, know what the what the encoding rule is, and we have to label the trellis diagram. I'm not telling where the labels come either, but it, but the but the idea is that between each on between each one of these connected nodes, for example, this one, there's an edge of a black edge which corresponds to an information bit which is a, a zero, and a red edge which is an information bit which is a one, and uh, and 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 when you do the so you use this as an encoder. So let me give an example of encoding. Suppose we want to encode one one zero one. Forget the two zeros of the block. So here's how it works. The encoder starts at the initial state here and takes this, the information bit, 1101, as a, 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 a map. This is a, your, a guide to the treasure. Uh, a, a black bit or zero means go to the left. A red bit or a one means go to the right. And so you follow this, uh, these four bits. And we go. The first, first bit is a one, right? So it means we go along this edge. Uh, that edge is labeled 11. One, one, so we Put that edge is the first that the first bit in the in the in the encoder. The next bit is also a one or a red bit. One zero, zero one. You can see this. So the encoding is a is a it's sort of a walk, a directed walk to a certain kind of a graph to use the mathematical terminology. But it's fairly clear what happens. Zero one. Go this way. Now there's a technical thing here that now so four four edges four bits and we've got a code word which is eight bits long but for technical reasons we need to drive this uh, little particle which is now actually in this state we have to drive him to the all zero state by putting in some dummy zeros which are the same which, which don't carry any any extra information but which are needed for the encoding process and there's the code word okay so that's the encoding we for with the diagram there's an encode we made it in, we've taken one one zero one and we've mapped it into one one zero one zero one zero zero one zero one one and we send it down the channel. So here's the transmitted code word. Again, there's like before, this the, the channel doesn't know whether you're using a convolutional code or a block code. And we're going to add two errors to it, just as an example. Uh, these particular errors are introduced not at random, and I'll tell you how they were chosen later. They're to make it hard for us rather than easy. And then the receive, the receive noisy code word is the same as the second one, except you can't tell which are the red bits, which are the black bits. So this is the problem that, that the Perturbi's algorithm solves. There. A decoding. So you have this trellis, which could be used for an encoder or decoder or none of the above, and you get a noisy code word. And so the problem is to find out which of the paths, so, so, the, so the, it's really an inference problem or a detective problem. The encoder took one of these paths from point A to point B. Which path did he take? Well, we have some evidence. We know that, that, that whatever path the, the encoder took, it, it output two bits at every change of state. And, the, and, and so we want to find that path through the trellis, which is most like the, the, the transmitted word. Now, this is an example of such a toy you can do it in your head, OK? But don't, don't, don't tell me the answer ahead of time. The, the thing that makes Viterbi's algorithm so profoundly useful is that if I extended this trellis diagram to a thousand, a length of thousand, then the total number of paths through the, through the trellis, there's two choices for the first bifurcation, two choices for the second bifurcation, two choices for the third bifurcation, two to the 1,000th possibilities. And so the, 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 the decoding question is, which of the two to the 1,000th uh, paths is most like what was received? But I'm just going to do it for this small example because I have limited time. Okay, 
So we're going to do this decoding. And the first step is called calculating the branch metrics. We're going to, we want to see, we want to compare. This is evidence. In evidence in, in time duration one, two, from time duration three to four, the encoder went along one of these eight edges and it output, uh, it output something which we can't see, but we, its noisy version is zero, one. So it, if, if it went along this edge, that means the channel must have made one error. If it went around this edge, one error. This, in fact, if you look down at this edge, this is very likely. Uh, zero, one is if, if it went along edge zero, one, then it output zero, one. And that's assuming the channel is unlikely to make errors. That's very likely. But on the other hand, to get to this edge, you needed to do some other path. So the branch metrics is simply this. If you look at the first, first uh, received die bit from the channel, and you compare it to the first, let's, let's say, what, maybe the encoder went this way. If the encoder went that way, then the channel made one error. Maybe it went this way, and those are the only possibilities. If it went that way, the channel also made one error. Okay, now let's see if what, let's go to this snake. If the, if the, if the channel, if the, if the encoder went on this path, then it didn't make any errors. If it went on this path, it made two errors, and so forth. And so just like uh, Julia Child, I, I'm going to say, I, 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 I did this at home. I did this for all of these branches, and I made a computation replacing the label on the uh, edge with the number of errors you have to postulate that the channel made if that, if, that, if that hypothesis was correct. Let me see if I can get this to work. There. So uh, I did this ahead of time. And so now, so now we've made, made the decoding problem into this. I've, I've indicated what penalty the channel had to pay, or you have to pay, if, if you're postulating a, a path through the trellis that went on this edge. So think of this as a toll. If, uh, if the encoder went this way, you have to pay a toll of $1. If it goes this way, you pay of $2. And you want to find that path through the trellis or that path from A to B with the smallest total toll, uh, which means that the smallest number of disagreements with what you actually received. And so you're really asking for what was the shortest path between this edge and this edge, right? There are 16 ways of going there. If I, if I take to, to decide that the, the weight of a path is the sum of the way of the edges, I just want to find that way through the trellis, which is, which is cheapest. Now, I want you, that, that's the problem that, that Viterbi's algorithm solves in a very efficient way. But before Viterbi's algorithm, there was an earlier algorithm uh, which was proposed by uh, Harold Minty called a string decoder. So let me, I, want you, I want to show you a way to build this, to solve this. We want to find the shortest path from A to B. So let's actually build this thing with, with each one of these square boxes being a knot and each one of these uh, black or red edges being a piece of yarn or macrame string of the given length. In this case, length one, length two, and we'll 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 make a cat's cradle, something like that. So, I've, so I've, I'm I'm making this model uh, out of string, and I'll take the uh, le left edge in my left hand, and the right point in my right hand, and I'll take the string model and I'll pull. And if you can imagine what's going to happen, the shortest path is going to come tight, and all the other paths are going to hang down low. That, so this has been proposed as a thought experiment for years. I actually did it. And so, with the help of of of, of Tomomi and Shirley, we're going to we're going to we're, I'm going to show you a string decoder, and we're going to see if it successfully solves the shortest path problem, if you will. I think. Can we have the lights, please? Can everybody see that? So let me talk about this a little bit before we actually do the experiment. Okay. So this is a, this is a model of that. Now there's some uh, compromises that we had to make. For example, let me get my uh, laser pointer. Some of the edges have length zero. I don't know how to do that. Okay. So let's look at this. This has let's this 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 is this corresponds to this node. And this corresponds to this node, sorry. Oh, that's good, put up there. And this, this edge corresponds to one. See, the problem is there's a physical mismatch. If I want, the, the length of this edge is given by the number of errors postulated by the channel, okay? Uh, but on the other hand, this edge, has to be, this edge has to be long enough to reach physically from one node to the next. 
So uh, th th that was one of the many engineering problems that we had to solve to do this. So we, so we, added, a, we added a fixed constant to each one of these edges, which is, this is the longest edge that, can, that, that, that you need to be. So the actual length of the, the edge in the build is some fixed constant plus one times, I guess is one inch or, or plus two inches. Anyway, uh, this is as close as we could come to do it. So this, th these edges correspond to these numbers up here. So we should be able to do the decoding and the audience should do, do recover from two errors. They're bad weather too. Okay, here we go. We, who's going to do what? Are you going to do the middle? Okay. Okay, just like rehearsal, guys. Cross your fingers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, so you have to the, remember the last two are going to be black, but you have to read the first four. So read. The, so it's somebody you're supposed to reading from left to right. The winning path is. Who said red, red, black, red? That's correct. <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> I have a lot to say about that, but I won't. The, what, what, the problem with building this model turns out to be not the length of the shortest path, but the length of the second shortest path. Because the, the shortest path will be at the top, but the second shortest path will be at the bottom. Now, if you think about this, so this is for people who know more. This convolutional code has free distance 5, so it's capable of correcting two errors. If I make two errors, it's, it's, the second shortest path is liable to be only three distance 3 away from it. And so the shortest path is, is, is this, and the, and the next shortest path have distance uh, one inch difference. And one inch out of three or four feet doesn't make very much, in fact, the, the accuracy of cutting this. So here's the research, but we can do better than that. It's possible to choose the two error pa pattern so that the next shortest path has distance four, thereby increasing the, the length of the second shortest path from three to four. And uh, I was very proud of myself when I found that. Okay. So now you've seen a string decoder, and uh, this this I, I, I let me, let me read this. This is from a paper, 1957 paper. The shortest root problem can be solved very simply, as follows: Build a string model of the travel network where knots represent cities and string lengths represent distances or costs. Seize the knot Los Angeles in your left hand and the knot Boston in your right hand, and pull them apart. And this is the part I like the best because he's if the model becomes entangled, have an assistant. <laughs> Untie and retie the knots until the entanglement is resolved. <laughs> Eventually, one or more paths will stretch tight. They then are alternative shortest routes. It is well to label the knots since after one or two uses of the model, the identities are easily confused. <laughs> okay. So Andy was not um, was satisfied with this, and I want to show you how Viterbi's algorithm solves the same problem, and then we'll go on to something else. Okay, so here's the problem. If Turby's algorithm, it, in this case, is, it finds in a systematic, foolproof way the shortest path or the cheapest path from point A to point B by working recursively or, or systematically from the left to the right of, of the trellis. So we start at the initial state and we move to this state. So the question we... So the question we ask is, what is the length of the shortest path from zero, from this node to this node? Again, this starts, the answer is obvious. There's the length of the shortest path is the length of the longest path is the length of the only path, which is one. Okay, now we go down to this guy. What is the length of the shortest path to here? The answer is that the shortest path is the longest path, the only path is one. Nothing, this is really the initialization of the algorithm. Okay, the, there's only one path to this node, and it, 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 goes, it goes through here with an increment of one, so it costs one unit uh, to get this far, zero to go out to the next one, and uh, there, the, the distance path is short as one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this fast. I'm going to do every one, but I'm gonna, so you should be able to, so two plus one is three, one plus one is two, see? 1 plus 1 is 2, and 1 plus 1 is 2. Now I want to do one more because this is where the famous add, select, and compare 
uh, it, part of the algorithm comes through. So this stage, now there are two ways to get here. I could have come to this node only either from here with an initial cost of one and an, an, a branch cost of one for total cost of two, or, I've come, or I have, could come through here with a cost of two plus a cost of one is equal to three. So one plus one is two, two plus one is three, the shortest is two. And now, because we're going to have to find our way back along the shortest path, I want to erase the, the, the edge which didn't win. So, you see, 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 so follow along now. This is one plus one is two, or two plus one is three. See if you can see that it's going to be two, right? And we get that run, and this one's going to be three. Right. Okay, so now, what do we have here? At this stage, we have the, the, the shortest, the length of the shortest path from uh, the, the initial state to all the states at this depth into the trellis. So this is, so, and since the winning path, whatever it is, has to go through one of these four, uh, I, I, I know that the first part of the path, the, the first part of that path must be one of these paths to these intermediate nodes. So we continue, the shortest path out to here is at length two, and we like that. Okay, we're almost done. We're at the end part of the trial. The point: this is slow, and maybe it's not clear at the first at the first, uh, at the first uh, practice with this. But the, the the time it takes to move one one uh, unit further into the trellis is independent of how far you go. It just it just it it, it, it involves measuring the length of eight edges. So that so the, the the coding time is linear in the depth into the trellis, even though the number of paths is exponential. And we're almost done. And there's Viterbi's algorithm. It's found those, not only the shortest path to the to the uh, to, to the end. So the length of the shortest path from zero to here is two. Uh, the, it, get, it also finds the, the, the length of the, all the other shortest paths. The shortest path of this guy has length three. The shortest path of this guy has length three. And furthermore, we can find what that shortest path is, and thereby get our information bits by doing this. And that's all there is to Viterbi's algorithm. It's, now, Viterbi's algorithm gets more complicated. When we tell it to students, it's good to give them this initial experience because they soon get into problems with overflow, um, memory management, uh, various compromises that, you have, that, that they have to go through. But this is the basic idea. So that's up, that brings us up to date. How do you teach Viterbi's algorithm in 2007, at least 2006, to, uh, to undergraduate and graduate students at Caltech? Now, uh, this young man sitting to my right is Ed, Edwin Sodermach, and he and his wife, Tomomi, who was sitting to, over there to my left, were the students who uh, helped me make this Hamming code, this flash animation of the Hamming code. So a couple months ago, I said, Ed, come here. Uh, uh, what, what can you do for the Viterbi algorithm? Can you do He says, I don't want to do another flash animation. I said, what do you, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to write a, I want to, I want to make a movie. Uh, and so uh, that's what we're going to, so, so Ed, Ed did that. Let me see. He's, he's made a movie, so let me tell you, so let me, t I, I, I guess the less said the better, but this is for, for, stu for, for students of the information age who want to watch everything on TV. This is a story, something like, something like the TV show Numbers. Uh, th this, is, this is the story of three girls who are, under, who are uh, uh, un undergraduates or graduate students? undergraduate students and and they they're having social problems um, and Viterbi's algorithm is useful so uh, <laughs> you ready Ed Sotomaji he wrote directed and produced this thing it takes about 20 minutes so you
There's no sound.
suppose you arrive home and a gift appears. Okay, so now based on each circle's label, I copy the appropriate score from the table to the space next to the circle. This circle points to the root circle that contains zero. So you add 20 and zero and copy into the circle. This circle also points to the root circle zero. So add zero to 19 and copy here. So now suppose you arrive home and there's no gift. Well, Wednesday mornings are supposed to be free. So no gift, um, that means I label the circles with X's. And I copy the scores from the table as before. Now, this circle has two choices to go back. The path pointing to the one containing 20, or the path to the one containing 19. What should I do? Gizmo says we should pick the path to the circle with the smallest number and erase the path to the other circle. Oh, I get so, it, I get it. Add the previous content, which is 19, to the score, 15, and copy the result, 34, into the next circle. So then we do the same thing with the next path. Oh, so this process repeats itself. Exactly. So awesome. Create trellises for your suspects. The one with the highest score will be your most possible secret admirer. And then the winning path will show you his pattern of activity. Don't worry, Sandra. I can write a program for the security algorithm. Hmm, wow. Thanks, you guys. No problem. All right, let's clean up this board and grab some dinner. Yes. You still here, James? Yeah. Should have asked for a fork. I think I'll take a cookie break. Nah, -uh. your meal first. Ugh. My parents. Eat vitamins. No more math club. Go to med school. Sorry, guys. So, what's up? Gizmo, I mean, the Turby algorithm doesn't work. All three suspects are equally likely. It should work. We must have missed something. So, the gift probabilities have to be different for each suspect. So, one suspect is more likely to send a box of chocolates than the other? Exactly. So, Sandra, what were the five gifts you received? Before the winter break, it was two boxes of chocolate and a kaleidoscope, and after the winter break, a shriveled flower and a CD. I already told her we can't use the chocolates as clues. Especially after you ate them all. You were afraid they contained love potions. Okay, okay. I agree with Jill. But she can eat all my chocolates? <laughs> no, that chocolates are far too common. So, let's go over your suspects. Who's most likely to have given the kaleidoscope? Steve, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, so we have to increase his kaleidoscope gift probability. Why do you think so? At the freshman camp club fair, Jill and I visited the Pictionary Club booth, where we met Robert, the Pictionary Club officer, and Steven, the guy from the Star Wars Club who followed Robert around. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> Rewind. Rewind. Ah, this is fun. <laughs> See, this is why you have got all the new members. I mean, I can't recruit new cadets after the great disturbance <laughs> in the force. What are you talking about? He was talking about the quarter our university start flooding dirty. Our members even voted to stop the annual storm troops parade. <laughs> and they don't want these sirens to see them in their costumes. Yeah, even the members of your master Jedi Council fled for the evil chess club. They really cashed in on you guys. They all needed a new marketing strategy. Yeah, some on a Darth Vader mask. Yeah, take that off, man. See, now doesn't he look so much better? What you really need is a complete makeover. It's, it's brilliant. I'm now Luke Skywalker. Sandra, you could be my princess Leia. I mean, we could rebuild this club anew. Uh, are you Jill? It's been kind of late. Should we go? I thought you wanted a rematch. So thanks to Jill, we played another game. 
Steven and I won the second round. Of course, Jill wanted to break the tie, but I convinced her to leave before Steven was back to his Star Wars self. If anything, Club Fair Day confirmed one thing. Just like high school, college is just another theater where characters with diverse intellects, physiques, and popularity perform in the drama that is school life. A school where boys believe girls to be sirens, and they get to be the knight. Now you guys know what I went through here. You're right. Steven does sound like a kid who thinks a kaleidoscope would be a romantic gift. What about the music CD? I think it was Parker. What about Steven? Steve is cute and sweet. Do you really think he listens to any music not written by John Lennon? So, what music's on the disc anyway? Oh, I haven't played it. I was afraid it contains viruses or backwards messenger syndrome. So, how do you even know it's music on the disc? Who's Parker? Remember the talented musical duo calling themselves the Four Arts at the Freshman Camp Talent Show? Well, first I wondered why the name wasn't the Two Arts. Yeah, I thought that was weird, too. After the show, I went to see Owen, the trombone player, and told him, my friend Sandra thinks you guys are awesome. <laughs> nice. As usual, Sandra found a way to a board game. <laughs> hey, don't help, please. So, what does the name for art stand for? Do you guys lose the numbers or something? The name stands for the Four Cultivated Arts of College Gentlemen. Music, chess, calligraphy, singing. We need to work on our calligraphy and pencil. You're not a quartet? <laughs> <laughs> no. We'll do it. What's your main interest? Um, AI. Alan Iverson. Artificial intelligence. Yeah. Parker surrendered to Sandra. We need to work on their board games, too. <laughs> Here, away from Mom and her boyfriend's band, no more deafening drums and electric guitars, just the sweet sounds of wooden metal. Only hours at the library instead of the mall. No boyfriends demanding short blonde hair, just friends who really care. Later that day, I called and thanked my high school science teacher for pointing my way to college. Not to put a damper on your story, Jill, but... There will be days when you wish you'd chosen another school. Finally, the shriveled flower. Must be Nigel. Nigel, the biology major? How'd you run into him? I was playing with my cell phone when Nigel politely told us that we were sitting on his favorite bench. Beg your pardon. Join my seat. I told him the seat was taken, but he went ahead and sat down anyway. President of the chess club. How do you do? He practiced alone, but that didn't stop him from annoying us. You see, male and female jumping spiders both have on their faces and legs masks that glow in ultraviolet light. Male spiders are far more colorful. It's interesting, isn't it? Does your club have female members? No. We wouldn't know how to name them. Historically, our club members are called knights. What should we call female members? Damsels. <laughs> What's more astounding is the difference between male and female birds. Testosterone is the reason why male birds have it all. Gorgeous plumage. Strong immune system. And melody. I can go on and on with this topic, but I think you get the gist of it. You're right. Nigel seems the most probable to represent that shriveled flower. Can I get my cookie now, please? Yay. That meeting with Nigel was eerily similar to the opening scene of my favorite movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey. I felt like as if we were the monolith. Oh, he... the one with a bunch of apes in it. The ape plays with the bone. Then he figures out the bone. First.
first he hits other buttons, then other apes. He hogs the bun, and then later the oasis. Millions of years later, he evolves into someone who says, without testosterone, you can't quench your thirst for knowledge here. yourself and your enemies leads to 100 victories and 100 battles. I think we just got a major clue. Right, and we need to update their probabilities of skipping class. But what kind of fortune cookie quotes the art of war? And that lottery number sounded really familiar. Jill's mission is to gather information. We want to confirm how often the suspects skip class and combine this with our estimate of their gift probabilities. Jane, of course, provides us with motivation. Hello? Hey, Jane. So here's the summary. Parker never skips class, is busy during free time, and has low gift probability. Stephen rarely skips class, has high gift probability, and Nigel often skips class and has average gift probability. We can update the challenge. Okay, so based on schedules and gift probabilities, the chalice is now showing two prime suspects. Hold on, Jill, let me call Sandra. Hello? Hey, Sandra, get on your messenger. Jill's on the phone, too. Hey, Jill. Hi, Sandra. Okay, Jane, I'm on now. So, what do you guys think? Neat, huh? So you made a fake profile for me on myeigenspace.com. Yeah, and I placed the audio file in there just for him. That's the cheese in our mousetrap, baby! Slam! You know, I feel kind of bad. Remember, Sandra, all is fair in war and love. Won't he be afraid of being traced? Most students in this school know how to cover their internet tracks. Pop quiz. Once he listens to the audio file, what's next? Since the file is under Sandra's profile, he'll want to check out her My Eigenspace page. Aren't secret admirers so predictable? So, my fake profile contains fake comments from my fake friends. No, Sandra! Fake comments from real friends. <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> Look at what Jane wrote. Jill, I'll miss you, Sandra. Sandra, I'll be back in a few months. Jane, when can we help you pack? Sandra, Tuesday would be good. Even better, read further. Sandra, I wish Jill hadn't eaten all the chocolates. Now I'll never know how good they <laughs> taste. He'll think if he doesn't deliver a gift this Monday, he'll miss his chance for a few yeah. months. We'll make him deliver his next gift at the time of our choosing, so Sandra doesn't have to skip so many classes waiting for him. Okay, Sandra, my mission is done. It's all yours now. Okay, guys, better get started. Wish me luck. Good luck. Bye. My mission is to design and distribute posters to establish communication with my secret admirer and lure him into the trap. He will immediately recognize this poster because the design is taken from his own kaleidoscope. He'll want to listen to the sound file I wrote there. The file is readable only by three profiles Jane created. Since he doesn't know the usernames and passwords for the profiles, he'll only see a red username box and a green password box. To make sure only my secret admirer reaches the audio file, I make him identify the type and order of his own gifts. He'll look for clues in the groups of colored letters on my poster. He'll figure out that he has to unscramble the words and arrange the colored letters into usernames and passwords. In each group, two words can be solved only with a very specific knowledge in chess, music, or Star Wars. Neat, huh? <laughs>
So thanks to the Viterbi algorithm and the help of my friends Jane and Jill, we caught Stephen red-handed. I was flattered and relieved to find out that those gifts were sent only to persuade me to join his Star Wars club as Princess Leia in order to win back members who had left for the chess club. Talk about being inept. Steven threw away his Vader mask. We enlisted a famous chess teacher to help us beat Nigel at his own game. And we found ourselves a new friend. Should we do this for Ed or for me or? <laughs> Stunned silence. <laughs> okay, Sandy, I guess you want to, you have some things to say? Okay. Uh, we're, Ed and I, he wants to do some more editing ab about it first, because he, he did this under, a, that, that's an enormous amount of work representing something like that. And he had a, he had a deadline of a couple of weeks, and I think he's, he's, he wants to do some more work. Especially the audio, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to answer your questions, yes, we're going to use it. <laughs> okay. I have another, another question here. Uh, after you saw Dr. Viterbi's solution, did you go, oh, of course? <laughs> it's related to the, uh, the, the, the algorithm. Yeah. Among the original algorithm. Yeah. Well, it, I, I think so. It's one of the things. So why didn't I think of that? For self-explanatory. I don't think he did that. He proposed it as an algorithm. I think. I think Andy just went for that. Pro propose it as a step in a proof. <laughs> but if you read it, it, it all, 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 the, all the, the, the survivors and metrics, the, the, the algorithm is there. I think it, it, it like, like a lot of problems, the, the original solution seemed very complex. In the hindsight of several decades, it looks trivial. But the, 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 but the real problem that you've overcome is not the algorithm, to understand the problem so that, so that it yields itself and it makes, makes a, an algorithmic solution. And we, people really didn't understand convolutional codes very well at all back in that. that so so it's, it's easy enough to solve a sort of past problem once it's stated as sort of past problem. But if you're asked to imagine why you're decoding a convolutional constructions rather than convolutional code, it's not at all obvious what the, what the right question is, let alone the answer. Did FC ever make you an offer? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The math department, I think. Back in 1967. Is that right, Saul? I can't remember. Okay, any other questions? I, I might add to that that uh, uh, to further a, a, another area of your talent and the students' talent, that USC has an excellent cinema school. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, uh, we have something for you as a memento. Uh, it's, uh, if you come up here, we have a, it's an honorary Trojan kit. <laughs> and it includes some uh, souvenirs that we have. Uh, one thing is a, uh, a Viterbi uh, pen. And P-E-N. Pen, a regular pen, a, uh, a Viterbi mouse pad, <laughs> highly coveted, very hard to get these. Okay. Thank you. And finally, uh, a brand new item uh, available since last fall, a Mingxia oh. uh, Department of Electrical Engineering t-shirt. <laughs> I'll wear it with this great pride. Okay.
This one, uh, this one is a large. If it doesn't fit, come and see oh, me. Okay. We can trade it in on another size. Okay. Thank you once Thank again. That was very entertaining and very educational. Okay. No one wants to go home. Do you have <laughs> <laughs>